Uh, welcome back, everyone, uh, to our last talk today. And we have uh, Jamie Rollins talk about using observation as experimental data for uh, medical decision making. Um, again, please, during your talk, just uh, clarifying questions. And uh, yeah, then after that, we'll have a panel discussion where we can have a more kind of take on the more bigger picture questions. All right. Yeah, with that, Jamie, please uh, take us away. OK. Um... Thanks for having me. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, using observational experimental data for medical decision making. Um, so, most of this talk is just going to be um, uh, opinions and concerns. And um, there's uh, a good um, puzzle at one place and some interesting technical stuff at the end, or semi technical. Okay. So, the Big issue is, so I've been doing for years, trying to develop methods to get um, estimate causal effects in um, medical settings from observational data and from randomized trials, especially when something's gone wrong, like non-compliance. And so the question everyone asks in medicine is how do we know we are right when we say there's an effect or there isn't an effect based on these analyses. And there's now something called the Causal Lab at the Harvard School of Public Health. And this was, there was an initiated symposium in November 2021 on this topic. And uh, so we want to determine how successful we're being and how do we adjust our method, methods to become uh, more so. And this is uh, an aspirational talk, the sense of what if we did not have re resource constraints in terms of money and most importantly, trained causal analysis experts with substantive scientific knowledge and judgment. That is, we could have what we wanted. Um, how do we tell what, or what works when and where? The when and where refer to the fact that we are always asking in the context of a particular causal question observational database, all of which are constrained by sample size, rigor, and comprehensive data collection, substantive issues. Um, whether there's a lot of confounding by indication. Confounding by indication is when the doctor, doctor gives you the drug because you're doing badly, so those who badly get treated more, which is uh, severe, at least severe confounding. And is the effect of treatment or adverse exposure likely small on, on a, uh, um, I, um, I meant uh, likely large on a risk ratio scale, but still important on a uh, medical or public health perspective, like common diseases like coronary heart disease, it's hard to detect small, um, uh, relative, either, uh, you can have a small relative risk that's hard to detect. That's what I'm the relative risk, can be, yeah, I said it wrong. The relative risk can be small, let's say 1.2, the risk ratio, but that could have a huge public um, health effect, if it's a, um, if it's a common disease. Okay, and so forth. Um, our longitudinal measurements frequent, measurement error control, so, so forth. And a lot of these studies are done with uh, electronic uh, health records. Um, and so the, this is all tied in with how should someone improve electronic health records, but I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm just talking about what you do in the face of current restraint, uh, um, constraints due to the nature of those records. So even the best causal methods don't lead to reliable conclusions um, when it filed lousy data. But historically, the best causal analysts generally could not always obtain access to good data. So I'm gonna tell you, since I've been around for a long time, what I'm gonna tell you is totally how it used to be in the 1980s and much less now, but not gone away. And uh, this is in the context, of, especially back in the 1980s, if no medical finding that had not been verified in a um, randomized clinical trial was um, considered by the medical profession to be valid with maybe cigarette smoking and so forth, rare exceptions. So why was that? Well, uh, here's how it used to go, how common it still is, I don't know. A specialist academic doctor could capture a large group of patients with a given disease, say rheumatoid arthritis. So you're a rheumatoid arthritis specialist, you're famous, you've written papers, people come to you. 
and you have this group of patients under you, okay? That makes for a research career because you get to publish clinical paper, papers, often observational based on these pa patients and you never have to share the data. Um, these doctors who have these data are not well tra uh, trained in design or analysis. Um, their only relative advantage was possession of the scarce resource, the patient's charts. Some would often rely on non cutting edge analysts who were loyal and willing to take subtle hints to make those p values less than 0.05. As a consequence, the valuable data source was used to publish often incorrect results while withholding data from the analysts that could correct them. The same doctors would then be vocal advocates this, um, that of the point of view that only RCTs and not observational studies could be trusted, not recognizing that they themselves were contributing to the lack of trust. Similarly, in epidemiology, investigators who started large longitudinal cohorts often would not share the data with other analysts, again, interfering with the self-correcting requirements needed for good science. But these things are changing for many reasons. I'm going to focus on one, the emerging understanding of the kind of things everyone here does, that design and causal analysis of complex longitudinal studies requires trained specialists, no less so than to say open heart surgery requires specialists. Current examples, my colleague Miguel Hernan was asked to participate in the design analysis of many observational studies of COVID during the pandemic including the recent important studies of vaccine efficacy using the Israeli uh, healthcare system data, which was the best available. 10 years ago, a well-trained group of Israeli experts seeking the help of an outside epidemiologist would have been much less likely. And so um, the very fact that there's now understood to be a discipline of causal inference is changing things. I won't go through the cause you all know that. Okay, um, so what should be our goal? Well, we'd like to provide a quantitative degree of confidence as to whether the analytic results we obtain with whatever our current state-of-the-art causal analysis, analysis methods are sufficiently reliable to have a significant role in decisions concerning medical and public health decisions. For example, changing treatment recommendations or regulating environmental exposure. Is that possible? And if so, how? And before continuing, I want to address a misunderstanding that always arises. Um, usually when you start talking about this, someone says you cannot establish causality from a single study, especially observational. Rather, meta-analyses must be done, or more importantly, you need different kinds of evidence brought to bear, triangulation, including biological studies, animal studies, biological plausibility. No one disagrees with any of this. But what I'm asking here is, does our analysis of the epidemiologic observational data or randomized trial data um, <coughs> um, provide in, uh, independent evidence of sufficient reliability to inform the process of triangulating the causal me uh, mechanism or causal effect. Um, and current ways that people are supposed to do meta-analysis like the Cochrane collaboration are not really up to the to the job, they, they go through a checklist, but they aren't very, um, uh, they aren't very modern, let's put it that way. Um, <clears throat> so to obtain a measure of confidence, we'd like to do some sort of meta regression where we regress some measure of the difference delta between our observational estimates of a causal effect and the true causal effect on various study covariates including the magnitude of the various constraints, limitations of the study being analyzed, that is various sources of bias and so forth. And there are many problems with implementing such an analysis. Basically, if we knew how, what were the factors that determine whether we did well or poorly in estimating a causal effect with our observational methods, um, data set by data set, study by study, we'd have some un a uh, good understanding of how we're performing. So that would be what we'd like. Unfortunately, we don't know the true causal effect, which makes that program a little difficult. The best one can usually do is use the results of a randomized trial that's been performed as a surrogate for the truth. So now the idea here is you is not that, um, is that most things that are studied aren't studied by randomized trials. It would be too expensive, it would be logistical and other uh, um, 
kinds of problems uh, in doing so. But to know what, so you have to use observational methods, but to do so, um, you would, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, to, to do so, to be right, you'd like to at least get correct results on randomized trials that have been carried out to be sure your observational methods applied to observational data sets are agreeing with the trials. So the question is, how do we make randomized trial surrogates as close as possible to the true effect in our observational study? Well, the basic idea is to emulate the actual randomized trial using our observational data, not necessarily, uh, usually on a different data set. And we emulate as closely as possible in terms of eligibility criteria. Uh, criteria, how treatment and outcome are defined and measured, the length of follow-up and so forth. Um, <clears throat> now, our observational study, of course, may differ from the RCT population, the distribution of both measured and unmeasured factors. In fact, RCT populations are um, well known for being cherry-picked to be the people most likely the drug companies think will benefit so that they can show their drugs good. Um, <clears throat> Now, measured factors, there's, you know, a whole host of methods, you know, um, um, you have dis different distributions of covariates. You can use likelihood ratios and so forth to um, try to uh, transport the results of your the trial to your observational study or vice versa. Um, <clears throat> um, so we can often adjust for those, but the unmeasured factors are a real problem. And notice that, remember that for seeing whether effects are the same in two treatment populations, um, the unmeasured factors don't have to be confounders. If you simply have a different distribution of an unmeasured factor U that causes Y that has nothing to do with treatment, you can get, um, the, you know, at times you can get different signs for the causal effect depending on the kind of interactions. So it's, a, in a certain sense, is a, a, a much more, a much harder problem than, um, confounding um, because you only uh, trans transportability. So the only way to directly address the difference in unmeasured covariates is to coordinate randomized trials uh, with observational studies. As an example, in settings where the number of eligible subjects for a randomized trial is greater than the sample size required for the trial or affordable, one can enter a random sample of the eligibles in the uh, a random sample of people eligible in the, for the trial and conduct on that group in a parallel observational trial emulation. That is, you split the, the people eligible for the trial in two groups. One, you do the trial. The other, you try to emulate it with observational studies. Um, <clears throat> and outside of such coordination, which is fairly rare, um, the best we can do is if we have multiple RCTs, one will get a sense of how close one could expect to get um, an RCT benchmark uh, to, to equal, to be close to an RCT we we're using as a benchmark by analyzing the heterogeneity of the effects among the trials themselves, or more ambitiously, if one get, get uh, access to the trial data, um, you can try to you know, emulate each trial using the other um, and so forth. Anyway, um, it's, but what's, in the end, it's crucial to understand the factors that make successful emulation impossible as well as possible. For certain outcomes and certain questions of covariates, it doesn't, no matter what statistical method you have, um, you won't ever be guaranteed you've, uh, that you can reproduce the causal effect that can be intractable, um, confounding. And, uh, but, for, but you have to know when that's the case versus when it isn't. And that's not, so you can see that's not only your statistical methods, but you need some empirical, a large empirical database having done these analyses and some criteria with all the problems I've just been describing to know when you got it right and when you got it wrong. Okay. Um, and um, as uh, another uh, point is I've been treating this as this randomized trials are the gold standard, but for millions of reasons, of course, they're not. Um, and, you know, they 
don't do things under post real world settings unless um, uh, in most randomized trial where they, um, the people, the follow up of people and the uh, way they're made to take the, you know, doses are monitored and so forth are very different than in um, uh, real, what, the, what would happen in the real world if it wasn't within a trial. And so, you know, it's very hard to compare the cause of effects you see in that situation to what you would see um, in an observational study where among free living people who are taking the drug or not as they see um, fit. Um, and, you know, trials have limited follow-up and huge number of exclusion um, criteria and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, along the way, you get many interesting questions, like if one's hoping to use observational analyses and decision-making, should the observational analysis be pre-specified in the way randomized trial analyses are, are in a protocol? Myself, I think uh, the answer should be is no, because um, they're just um, too many factors to a priori in observational studies um, uh, be able to say you are going to do precisely this. Uh, and then if you do it, you are going to not do things that will become pretty clear during the course of the data collection, other things that you wish you uh, had allowed yourself the right to do. Um, so that means the way forward is a more algorithmic approach to what will be done if various analytic problems arise, what to do about those outliers, about missing exposure data, et cetera, and to keep a record of every analysis to try to keep people from cherry picking. Um, that's a, this is a whole other topic, as everyone knows. Um, and, you know, we, uh, I'll go on from that. Okay. I'll go on to that. Um, Oh, this is it. So um, a major problem is to do the kind of thing I'm talking about would take huge resources and also uh, high level researchers um, who are dedicated to trying to understand how well um, observational um, analyses, which databases can return your causal results on uh, which substantive outcomes in what settings. And the problem is um, this is not what people get tenure for. As everyone knows, you know, you get tenure for developing new methods, analyzing novel studies with getting interesting new findings and publishable results. And the whole program I've been talking about is just the opposite. This is a major unsolved problem in uh, science, I think. Um, uh, Forget that. Um, uh, most of the methods that have been developed just before have been methods developed on the assumption of sequential ignorability. I'm thinking of longitudinal studies because that's usually what most medical studies are, um, um, allowing for um, unmeasured confounding just through sensitivity analysis. Uh, recently, um, especially with um, the uh, um, ML community entering the fray, there are now many methods that claim to adjust for unmeasured confounding under certain con conditions, provably under, usually under mathematical rather than subject matter um, uh, assumptions, I would say, except for um, proximal uh, 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 inference of uh, um, Miao Wang and Eric Chechen Chechen started the field um, where they actually have um, epidemiologic meaningful assumptions about what proxies would be, what kind of proxies would be available that someone could decide on um, subject matter grounds. Uh, you know, other assumptions, which may be true and may do great, we don't know yet, but are things more like, you know, having to do with. Um, ranks of matrices, sparsity, and other things, and how confound the serious confounders differ from you know, less important confounders in various ways related to those facts. And so only the kind of um, analyses I've been talking about um, will ever allow us to tell which of these um, 
assumptions um, reflect the real world, which don't right now. They're just um, methods papers. And the way to think of that, I think, is to think about all these new methods as black boxes, as they give you the data outcomes to causal estimate. And we don't know which of the black boxes, if any, is reliable. It's sort of like the history and ongoing history of um, omics analysis, where there's always been big data and many more experiments and uh, uh, you know, order of magnitude more experiments that could be done. And um, a lot of the methods are based on very detailed, excellent, you know, causal theorizing. Some are uh, methods to say, you know, what is causal, et cetera, are based on much less um, rigorous causal thinking, but that doesn't a priori mean one's gonna do better than the other because we don't really know enough to know what's driving things, um, uh, driving things. And this is much more true, I think, of um, observational data than uh, chronic disease than, you know, homics kind of data. It's uh, less of it, much more um, uh, complex and poorly measured. All right. Um, okay. And then we'll all wait for the day when everyone is randomized at every patient encounter, which will be a good day. But that itself, because it'll be so much quotes non compliance afterwards, because it, it, it'll just serve as many unconfounded benchmarks. Um, uh, all right. Um, I see. Okay. Now, now I practically run out of time, right? So the whole. Um, okay. So that the other two you're, parts. You're still okay. You can still go. Yeah, you can oh, have oh five to 10 minutes. Okay. So what are some of the methods uh, we've been using? Um, there are a lot of them, um, you know, um, and uh, I'm gonna describe some of the ways um, that we've been thinking for 15 years, but um, are some of them that I don't think have gotten into the literature very clearly. So first I'm gonna to have to talk about throughout this about you know, dynamic regimes where um, treatments can be A, X is gonna be the covariate subscripts there at time over bars history. So the dynamic regime G is, uh, is a function of your, of your covariates at time one, X1 um, <clears throat> that tells, uh, tell G1 of X1 is the treatment you're gonna take at time one and so forth. And finally, at the last time, capital P, GT of X bar T over bar is your whole history, covariate history, A bar T minus one is your whole best treatment history. And that's the uh, treat G of T is gonna be a uh, function telling you which treatment to take. So there are a lot of such regimes. Okay, and I'm gonna use HT for the past history. Um, and these, okay, let's just go on. So a target trial, so, so this is what we're doing with observational data, one way to think about it, it's this way of describing it rather than using counterfactual so much is very helpful in talking to physicians um, and other decision makers. So a target trial is a randomized trial one would like to conduct on let's say HMO members, but cannot do it for various reasons. Novel aspect of target trial emulation, what really has, change the way people think about it uh, is that each subject in the observational data is enrolled in all of the target trials for which he is eligible instead of a single trial. Um, so you get this big nesting. So it's a big methodological advance, although you'll see in a sense, it's not an advance because it's really just a structural nesting model, but I'll get to that in a moment. So we're gonna consider, so for an example, I'm gonna consider uh, emulation of um, the effect of postmenopausal um, hormone therapy on the five-year delta year risk of breast cancer in postmenopausal women in the HMO who've, and who've not taken uh, the criteria of the tri trial that not taken hormones for a year. Okay, there'll be a time index. Okay, so I have observational data. Uh, 
um, as shown over time on female members, um, <clears throat> where X is pretreatment data. We have a binary, every, I'm going to make everything binary. AT is treatment at time T. DT is if clinical breast cancer is diagnosed better before T. Um, I star T is um, indicates whether you're eligible for treatment. This is a, something if you have had a deep vein thrombosis, doctors won't give you um, postmenopausal estrogens and your I star T would be zero. IT is whether. Um, you're eligible for the trial, even if you could get treatment. So IT zero, even if a person hadn't had deep vein uh, thrombosis, if um, they had taken postmenopausal um, hormones in the last year as the criteria for the trial, what you should, shouldn't be able to then. Okay, so let's consider a, a, a concreteness. We take, uh, consider a woman who's trial eligible at T um, the trial outcome is development of clinical breast cancer within delta years. That's why T delta is uh, D, T plus delta. Randomized with probability uh, half to arm G star, G prime, where their treatment regime is being compared in the target trial. That is, you're trying to use the observational data to answer the question that would be answered in the trial I'm describing. We call it the, tar the target trial we're emulating. Okay, so. Um, um, uh, so uh, regimes might be, um, so G star, there is the regime, given your past when you, up to T minus one, you're entering the trial, take the one means take um, uh, postmenopausal estrogens for a year and then never take them again. That's, um, that's corresponding to a uh, regime of one year of treatment, which is sometimes given. Um, and you might compare that to um, from one year eligible, never taking treatment, one year versus never. That would be one contrast. Okay, and we're gonna take as our um, uh, um, contrast, I define counterfactuals. So now I'm gonna define counterfactuals. So this, the parentheses here is, says counterfactual. Yeah, so this is the counterfactual. If you, when you take your observed treatments with T minus one, take uh, treatment for one year and then take no more treatment after that, given uh, ST are your past observed covariate, some covariates you're interested in and uh, you are eligible for the trial. Minus um, the, the counterfactual where you never, once the trial starts, you never take treatment, zero rather than one. So that's the kind of thing we're trying to estimate. If it had been a true RCT, it would be identified just by taking the mean of the observed outcome delta years after the trial starts um, among people randomized to the regime G for D star versus people randomized to the other regime. However, of course, the variable G does not exist in the observational data since there was no randomization T equal four. Indeed, any other time, because all we have is observational data. That's what we're trying to emulate, that trial, but we don't have it. So there's no reason to privilege T for four rather than any other value of T where you might have started the study. That is, for particular choices of regimes G and G prime above, the observational data can be used to emulate many trials. In fact, any time, time, time T that you're eligible, you can be in a new trial. You are a given person can start many different trials as long as she's eligible. That is, hasn't had um, postmenopausal estrogens in the last year. Um, okay, so now the question is okay, so if we're going to do that, the question then is how should we analyze the trial? And I'm going to talk about how to analyze it under no unmeasured confounders. Okay, that is. Uh, you have sequential ignorability, or you can think of it as given your past history up to a given time, the probability you get treated in the observed data is, uh, is random. That, that is, it's by a coin flip with the probability on the coin, possibly depending on your entire past, um, <clears throat> so that there's no confounding. Um, <clears throat> of course, we don't know the coin probability. It's, the propensity score. So that's part of the estimation problem. Okay, so uh, 
So if we're going to um, if we're going to uh, do this analysis, we have to worry about whether over parameterization incoherence, you might think. So we're going to use the person over and over. And this that can be a problem. And in fact, um, an important part about these models, why they're useful, is they're not, this is not a problem. You can never get a, con you know, a contradiction. If you use what are called history adjusted marginal structural models, you do get contradictions because they're over parameterized. And if you want to ask me more about this in the discussion, do so, because it's one, one of the more interesting technical things. Okay. So how do I know how do I know that no matter what rule you use for these studies, I'm gonna be okay. If I um, okay, so I'm going to define what's called the um, <coughs> regime specific blip function. So you've given me a treatment regime, um, uh, G, and G bar T plus one. This counterfactual means take your observed treatment through T minus one, take treatment at T, and then follow the regime you, I'm taught, given you from T plus one on. So that's a particular counterfactual for a given regime, and I'm going to contrast it with the regime that only differs from that in that um, uh, in that you take zero at t and then follow the regime for the, from there on. Okay, so people who do um, optimal treatment regimes, this is very familiar to you with this being the optimal treatment regime, G, which is what you're trying to estimate because that's how you find depending on the sign of this, you either are treated at time t or not given your, um, given your past history um, is determined by this contrast. This is your optimal future. Um, so now the important point is, is if this guy is zero with probability one for all times t less than uh, K, I'm using K now for T plus delta. Call it, think of it again to follow up, but he's less than that. Then under sequential randomization, um, it, for all regimes, G, um, the counterfactual mean given the past is just the expectation of the observed Y given the past with probability one. Um, so what this is saying is, um, uh, this guy being zero, these single blips being zero, are all the information for any regime G you give me, these blips are, um, are all the causal contrasts that could ever be, uh, that are identifiable. Anything else you estimate patches these together. Um, you know, it can be a weighted average of them. But if these are all zero, everything's zero. So if given your past, one last blip of exposure, AT equal one versus AT equals zero, before reverting to any given regime, if that's all zero for every T, for every T and, and the under, and if K, let's just make K the under follow up, then there's going to be, um, the, there's going to be no causal effect in the sense that nothing identifiable, um, all identifiable um, causal contrasts are zero. That's all there is, okay? Um, and, but you get very different um, ways to analyze the data comparing based on this. And the reason is, is because of this dynamic regime, the different dynamic regimes you can choose. So, um, Again, the one you all know about is mm -hmm. choose the optimal Jay, regime. Yep. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Can you wrap up in the next one? Okay. We're yeah. running out of time. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So um, the um, the <clears throat> so the 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 regime where I where um, you take zero thereafter. Um, that was the zero. That regime is um, the one we we're talking for. Take one last blip of treatment before taking zero thereafter. On the other hand, this funny regime that says um, uh, what you should take at time T is 
the exact same treatment you took at time t minus one. You, I doubt you've seen this regime before, but this regime is the following. It's, uh, it's comparing always take treatment to never take treatment, no matter where you are. So let's say your observed history, you've gone up and down in, in a given moment, you've, um, you, um, the last time you took treatment, then you're gonna take, then the regime's asking you to take treatment from that point on forever. So it's like, whenever the, whenever the quote study starts, you're gonna take treatment forever. Um, if you last time took one, if you last time took zero, you're never gonna take it. But of course, this is the regimes I'm trying to estimate. In fact, some people in the data, this is it's gonna be hard, will take, but they're supposed to take one according to this regime, but they'll take zero. And it's that, it's because of that, you'll get, you have observational contrast to see. But in short, this weird regime is the one that always gives a contrast of always take treatment versus never take treatment, which is what's usually assigned in a true randomized trial. It's usually always take treatment versus never. And this strange structural nested model, which you've probably not seen before, reconstructs that where a person is allowed to start regimes as many times as they want, the, um, the actual contrast you'll get out of these whip functions are contrasts between at each time T, I'm gonna compare people who always took treatment to people who never took treatment. Um, that's much too fast, but um, I'll leave it at that. And it's well known how to estimate the parameters of structural nested models. So by knowing the structural nested model, knowing this under sequential randomization, just telling you what G is, is a complete prescription of how to analyze the data for the particular contrast you're interested in. Let's say you want always take treatment versus never, or you might take, take it for one year and then never. Those are those two different Gs I've shown here, zero or 18 minus one. And so that's a prescription for, for doing the analysis under no unmeasured confounders. Um, I'll stop there since I ran out of time. All right, great. Thank you so much for the nice talk, Jamie. All right, then we'll come to the panel discussion. I guess maybe you want to 